Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? See the desktop and everything? Everything seem okay? Yep. Okay. All right. What we're going to do today is what you need for to do the second program assignment. We're going to step through the evaluator code from language three, because that's what your homework assignment is to modify that evaluator code. So let me download it and, and um, well, let me see. Let me download language three and download homework two. I don't know if we'll talk, you know, we'll talk a little bit about homework. First of all, mainly we want to talk about uh, uh, assignment. We want to talk about language three, because that's what you really need to, to know to be able to do programming assignment two. Okay, so. Uh, okay. Um, Language three is this language. You're going to create language 3A, which is this language. And the difference is what you're going to create has these new operators in it. You're going to put those operators into the language, which that means is you have to take the evaluator and modify it to have those operators. So the thing we should do is look at exactly how language three. Oh, so see. This is the key file, the evaluate file, okay? Right now, this evaluate file is this one. So you have to add to this one to create language 3A. Okay, so language 3A is an extension of language three. And that file in that folder right now is, if you open it, it should be actually literally the same file. Like if you open this one and you open this one, and you compare them. The only difference is oh, let's see. Oh, there's probably some, I should clean that up. There's, um, I'm not even sure what it's saying is the difference. The only difference should be that this is in this, you know, this has this one. Okay, language 3A has that in the grammar. Okay, notice that the, none of the differences are in the code. Okay, okay, all right. So you're going to extend. You're going to extend this evaluator, which starts out as this evaluator, to have three new operators. So what we want to do today is talk about how this one works, how it does all the operators in language three, so you have a sense of how you would at you know, what you would do to modify to make create language 3A. So Let's go here. Let's go here and start talking about exactly how does this evaluator work. Okay, so start with the language. Okay, there's the grammar for the language. Okay, it tells us what we can write. You know, you know, a, a program in this language is either an expression by itself or a left parentheses, the keyword prog and then a sequence of expressions, okay? So now here's a bunch of example, okay? So this is a program in that language and it's an expression. This is a program in the language and it's an expression. Here's another program in the language and it's a program. So it's a program followed by a sequence of expressions, okay? So every string here is one program. That's one program, that's one program, that's a program, and that program, notice it's essentially, it's a print statement followed by a variable declaration. And here's another program. It's a variable declaration followed by an AND operation. There's another program. It's a variable declaration followed by a multiplication. Notice all these are invalid though. There's something wrong with all these. Like in this one, you can't print X if X hasn't been declared. So that's actually wrong. This one, you can't add something to X if X hasn't been declared, okay? Uh, here, these guys are in the wrong order. See, the print X appears before the variable declaration. So that's not gonna work. They should really be in the other order. 
Okay, here there's a variable x, but it's of type integer. Here's an and operation that refers to x, but that's the wrong type. So that's going to cause some kind of problem. And here the variable x is a Boolean, but here it's used like if it was an integer. So that's going to cause a type problem. Okay, so these these are all examples with little mistakes in them. Okay, and then here's a program that hasn't any mistakes in it. It declares a variable x and then it, it declares a variable x to be two and then sets it equal to two. So it's just kind of silly a piece of code, but it just assigns two to the variable x twice. Okay, here's a program. Now, now here to make it more readable, I'm using the continue. I'm using a concatenation here. So it's it's really one string because I'm concatenating this line with that line with that line. So it's one string, and there's the comma. I'm creating a an a, uh, I'm creating an array of programs. Okay, so this is just to make it easier to read. So the program declares a variable x and then declares a variable y equal to x. That's a program. Okay, and then here's a little bit more elaborate one. The program is three essentially three statements, variable x, the variable y, and then the variable z equal the sum of x and y. Okay, so that's the whole program, okay? Now, every one of these programs is a tree because we're using a tree language. Like, so this one, like if you take that one there, oh, well, if you wanna see the tree, now what this program does is it, steps through each one of this program, steps through this list of programs, okay? It iterates through that list of programs. And for each program, it builds, first thing it does is it takes the program and builds the tree for it, okay? After it's built the tree, it prints it out one way, prints it out another way, prints it out another way, just prints the same tree out three different ways, okay? Then it evaluates the tree. That's the thing we want to talk about. It evaluates the tree. Okay. The value you get back is either an integer or a Boolean. But see, we can't have functions in Java that return either int or Boolean. Java doesn't let us do that kind of thing. So that's why we have to have this value type that can hold both about a Boolean and an int so that this guy returns a value. And inside that value, okay. back, Check. what? The question? Yeah. So evaluate returns a value object. Inside the value object is a tag that says whether the Boolean field or the integer field is the one you should look at. Okay. So this, since this guy sometimes returns it, remember, if you look at these guys, some of these are Boolean expressions and some of them are integer expressions. So the expressions in a program can either be Boolean or integer. Yeah. So you don't, you never know when you evaluate a program, you never know ahead of time whether the program is going to give you back an integer or give you back a Boolean. So both of them are wrapped in the same kind of object. And then you just print out the object. Okay. Here I print out the object either verbosely or simply. In a minute we'll see. This, this if statement is just saying if debugging is turned on, print out a verbose version of the value, which shows you the tag and all the fields. If the debugging is off, it prints a simple version of the value, which doesn't show you the tag. It just shows you the proper value. If the tag is bool, it shows you the Boolean part. If the tag is int, it shows you only the int part. So you can either print out the verbose version of the value, or you can print out the simplified version of the value. Okay, so depending on whether the debug, debug version, what the debug flag is set to, okay? So our goal of today is really to talk about this function here, the eval function that processes this tree. Now, now after the tree has been processed, I went ahead and pretty printed, I print the tree out using uh, dot, using uh, graph viz. If we run this, I'm going to close that. Now, notice what it's done is it's printed out all these trees for us. See, there's the picture of the trees. So let's look at one of them. An interesting one would be this one here. 
Okay, this is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is the seventh tree. So that should be tree number 7. Okay. Okay. The program. The okay, We start with program. The program tree has one, two, three branches. The program tree has one, two, three branches. It's got a ver branch. The ver branch has the variable x and the number two. Then the next ver branch has the variable y and the number two. And then the next ver branch has the variable z with the tree, the subtree addition of x and y, the subtree of the addition of x and y. Okay. That's the tree the evaluator has to process. So the, the evaluate, no, the evaluate program, let's go ahead and open it. The evaluate program is a program, starts off by reproducing the syntax. Okay, so it just, it just reproduced the syntax again. Okay. There's that debug flag that determines whether the, the whether it should spit out lots of information or just give you a final answer. Okay. Here's the top level. Okay. You start here. Okay. So when the here when you call evaluate tree. When you evaluate tree, you enter evaluate there. There's evaluate tree. Okay. So you're going to walk this tree. Okay. So we want to, we're going to step through this program and we're going to use this as an example. We'll step through this program using this as an example and see how it processes it. Okay. So the first thing that this function does is it creates an environment. That's the thing that's going to hold X, Y, and Z. You've got to have th something that remembers the values of your variables. Okay, so we 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 talked the other day about the environment class, which, so we can open up again. The environment class stores these variable value pairs, and it creates it. It does it real simple. It has a list of variables and a parallel list of values. I kept it real simple: a list of variables and a parallel list of values. So the third variable in this list. Its value is the third value in this list. Okay, so that's real, real basic. Those two lists should always have the same length. For every variable, there should be one value. Okay, so when you create an when you create the environment object, you create an empty list of variables and an empty list of values. So the evaluator starts off by creating an empty environment. Okay, so that creates this empty environment. Later on, you can add a variable value pair to the environment, okay? When that's what these guys are gonna do. This their declaration is gonna essentially add X2 to an environment. This one's gonna add Y2 to the environment. This one's gonna add Z, whatever the result of doing this addition is. So this will add to the environment Z and whatever value gets computed over here, okay? You can add a value to the environment, you can ask an environment, is a variable defined? You know, is, is X already in the environment or is it not? You can look up, if X is in the environment, you can ask what's its value. So you can look up the value of a variable. So you notice that defined takes a variable and gives you back a Boolean. True for it's defined, false for, true this variable's in the environment, false this variable's not in the environment. Look up takes a variable and it returns the value. And it returns no if you actually look up a variable that's not in the environment, the return value will be a null rep pointer. Okay. So it'll return null when a variable can't be found. Okay. Then you could update a variable. Given a variable and a value, you can put that new value in that place in the variable. Now, this is a Boolean. What it does is if this variable happens not to be in the environment, then it makes no sense to update it. So this thing returns false. So false would be an error condition saying that variable wasn't in the environment. 
if the variable is not in the environment, I could have written update to just create it in the environment, but I didn't want to do that. That's actually, it's better to do it this way. If the variable, when you call update, if the variable is not in the environment, return false and don't change the environment. If the variable is in the environment, give it this new value, okay? It could have been written the other way around. It could have been written where update always puts this into the environment. If it's there already, it updates it. If it's not there already, it adds it. And in fact, you, then you wouldn't need the um, you wouldn't need the add function. You could just have an update function and not even have an add function. I, I thought this is a better design. You use add to put new values in the environment, and you use update to update current values in the environment. But not everybody thinks of it that way. Okay. And then that's it. So that's the whole interface to environment. Okay. So we're, we're going to follow this program as the, as this, this program will manipulate the environment. Okay. So go back here. The very first thing now, the event, the, when you end, not every program uses the environment. So if a program, let's see, let's look at one of the, let's see. Here's our examples. Actually, all these did. For example, this would be a real simple program. But it wouldn't use the environment because it just prints the constant five. Uh, another example would be another example. Here's a simple program. Okay. That's another simple program. So that's a program. It doesn't use the environment. There's a program. It doesn't use the environment. Here's another program that doesn't use the environment. Okay, so there's a program with three statements. It prints four, prints five, then prints the sum of four and five. Okay, that program didn't use the environment, but the evaluator always, the, the evaluator doesn't know ahead of time whether a program is going to use the environment or not. So the evaluator creates an environment right away. It doesn't wait to see if you need an environment. The evaluator just says, create an empty environment. Then evaluate the tree using that environment. Okay, so now we're gonna evaluate a program, use, which is that tree, evaluating that environment. Okay, now evaluate program, we think of that as going to over here in the language. That goes over to here. See, we're gonna evaluate one of these guys. So the way the evaluator is set up is there's an evaluate prog function, an evaluate exp function, an evaluate ver function, an evaluate print function, an evaluate bxp function, an evaluate uh, axp function. So there's an evaluate for every one of these productions in the language, okay? And then the code and the function says, well, how do I evaluate a prog? Well, I'm eva this is an or, so I'm evaluating either one of these, so call that a recursively, or I'm evaluating a sequence of these, which means I'm going to sequentially, sequentially call, you know, see, a program is either a single expression or it's a sequence of expressions. And an expression is either a variable declaration, a print, a Boolean expression, an arithmetic expression, an integer constant, a Boolean constant, or a variable. Okay. So a program is a sequence of expressions. And what the we're going to see, the function is going to say, to evaluate a program, I either evaluate one expression by itself, or if I see a left parentheses, I know that them, I'm in a tree that has a bunch of branches. Okay. So the evaluator starts off here, says, create the environment. Now evaluate, because program is the entry point to your language. So evaluate program, which is this tree using that environment. And then right here is evaluate program. It takes in a tree and an environment. Okay. It's going to produce a result. 
Okay. Right now, it, it just it declares the result, sets it equal to null, just to let you know this is where the answer is going to be. Okay. Oh, I got a mistake here. I've. Um, oh. Um, yeah. This I, I there's a I I create a this one shouldn't be. We already created the, I forget, I, I may have changed the other day. The environment's already been created there. This line of code should be gone. There, there's no need for another environment. That was a mistake. I I, I just essentially was re replacing this environment with another environment. So, but it's created there. There's the environment. So I don't need to create another one. Okay. So that was, a that was, uh, that was left over from an earlier, I've kind of gone through and do different iterations of this. So at one point I was declaring the environment here, then I decided it should be created up here. Okay, all right. So here's where we create the environment and then it gets passed to him. Okay, so the environment gets passed to him. So he doesn't need to create it again. There was no harm in that code. That code just replaced this environment that was passed, which was empty with another empty environment. So it was just kind of silly. It was just replacing one empty environment with another empty environment. So it, it wasn't a bug, but it's kind of silly to have that. That code was just left there from earlier. Okay, all right. So now I need to evaluate this tree using the environment that I've been given, which is at this point empty. Okay, the re and then the answer is going to be in this value object. Okay, I'm I'm looking at a a, a tree. The tree could either be. The tree is either an expression by itself or a prog. See, a program, an actual program is either a tree that starts with an expression or a tree that starts with the word keyword program. That's so that you could have, that's just so that you could have simple programs that are one line versus programs that are multiple line. You could have a program that's one line, one expression versus programs that are multiple expressions. So we need a syntactic difference between a single expression program and a multiple expression program. This guy plays the parole of a curly brace. Essentially, he's playing the role in Java and C of a brace that lets you put multiple lines together in a block. Okay, so I could have called this block. I could have called this a block. Yeah, instead of calling it um, program, it would also make sense to call it a block. You know, that's kind of the way Java calls them. In Java and C language, what's between curly braces usually referred to as blocks. But I, I decided to call it a program. Because we'll, we'll use the word block later on for something else. Well, we're going to make a distinction between a program and a block later on. Okay. So, so this, but this plays the role of like a curly brace. It lets you lump a bunch of expressions together. So you either have an expression by itself or you have a, bunch of expressions lumped together okay so the the evaluator gets in here and says which one do i have do i have a program or not okay now if oh i'm sorry do i not have a program or i do see i wrote not so if it's not program just evaluate one expression see so if it's not program if I'm not staring at a program root, then I have only one single expression. So I evaluate it and that's the result. On the other hand, so else, so it is a prog, okay? So this one it is a prog. So that means the grammar says that, that means it's a sequence of expressions. So I need to iterate the branches of this tree. So I'm, I've got a root that says P-R-O-G. So that means I've got a bunch of branches, okay? So I'm going to, the evaluator needs to now have a for loop that iterates through the branches of the tree. Now notice it iterates through the branches except for the last one. It doesn't do the last branch because the last branch is different than the other branches. This branch has a value and this branch has a value and this branch has a value. The return value of the program is the last branch. This value and this value are thrown away. So see, when you call the evaluate expression on these earlier branches, the return value is thrown away. There's no return. See, I don't capture the return value. 
on the last branch, I capture the return value because that's my result. Okay, so in this language, that expression's value is thrown away, that expression's value is thrown away, and that expression's value is the return value. Okay, if you go back over here, suppose you did the following. Suppose you wrote a program like this. That thing creates three values, the product of four and five, which just gets thrown away, the sum of six is seven, which gets thrown away, and five minus six, which is what the return value of this program is, okay? So the return value of the program is the last expression. Why in the world do we have these things which are gonna thrown away? Well, that's because you might have, they might do side effects. So let you print something and then let you print something. The value doesn't really matter. What you care about is the fact that you printed something. Another example of a side effect is if you do the following. Okay, now the value of this is thrown away, but I don't care. It's stored five in the environment. That's what I really care about it had the side effect of putting that in the environment. Similarly, this guy, that puts another value in the environment. Now I could multiply what the two values that are in the environment. So this has a value. The value of this is five, but the five is thrown away. But it has the side effect of putting the X5 pair in the environment. That's what I really care about. The value of this is six, but it's thrown away, but I don't care. I care about the side effect that it's stored six in the environment. And then the value of this is five times six is 30, but it got the X and the Y out of the environment. So these things were there to put something in the environment. And then this thing creates a value that's the result of my program. So the result of the program is 30. This has the side effect of putting something in the environment. This has the side effect of printing something out. These have no side effect, so they're worthless. Like this just doesn't do anything, okay? Because it creates a value and throws it away, creates a value and throws it away. No side effect, really worthless. On the other hand, I mean, I could do the following. Now that has a side effect. The value of this thing is 20, four times five is 20, but that's not really important. What's important is it prints 20. Now this guy's still useless, doesn't do anything at all. And then this guy returns a value, okay? So this returns a value from the program. This effectively does nothing, but use up CPU time. And this prints out a result. That's a side effect. There's no side effect there and that's a return value, okay? So side effect, worthless, return value. Here, side effect, side effect, return value, okay? And if I want, I could put something in here. I could say uh, print, and then I would actually have two things, both a side effect and a return value. That would actually do two things. That would compute this value here, print it out and return it as the value of my function. So that would return 30 as the value. So that would have a side effect and a return value because it's in the last position, okay? Yeah, and, and then I could also do things like I could say print X, okay? Well, that has a side effect. So side effect, putting something in the environment, side effect, putting something in the environment, side effect of printing something out on my screen, then side effect of printing something else out on my screen, also return value, because it's the last expression, okay? So the evaluator, when it evaluates the, the, it, the early branch, the first branches, all but the last one, it evaluates them. They may or may not have a side effect, 
but it throws away the return values. It ignores the return value. But when it gets to the last branch, then it saves the return value because that's what it returns. See, the value of the last expression is the return value of the program. Okay. And then this is all recur. Now, this is recursive. You to evaluate a prog, you call evaluate expression. Okay. That puts you in. this part of the tree of the language. So now there's going to be an evaluate expression. And what it does is it looks at, now each one of these is a tree. So this thing, this expression is really either a ver tree, a print tree, a B expression tree, an A expression tree, an integer tree, a Boolean tree, or a variable tree. So we're going to see in a minute that this function is going to check what kind of tree root it has. And then it's going to do different things depending on what kind of tree root it has. If it's got a ver root, going to call evaluate ver recursively. If it's got a print root, a print root, it's going to call evaluate print recursively. If it's got a Boolean operator root, it's going to call evaluate Boolean operator. If it's got an integer root, it just returns the integer. And if it's got a Boolean literal root, it just returns the Boolean. And if it's got a variable root, it's going to call, uh, it's going to look up the variable in the environment. So this will, when it, this guy will call this one recursively, call this one recursively, call that one recursively, call that one recursively. It'll just evaluate the integer. It'll evaluate the Boolean because these are literals. And if it's a variable, it just looks it up. So those will not be function calls. Those will be done here, but these will all be function calls down to here. So let's see what's follow through with that. Okay, so you get like here, the, the branch is, the branch is actually a ver, but this, the, this guy doesn't know it. He just knows that he's supposed to evaluate an expression. The first branch is an expression. So you call evaluate expression. Here's evaluate expression with a tree and the environment, the current environment, okay? You get the root and ask in a case statement, if it's a ver root, if it's a print root, if it's a, Boolean operator root, if it's a comparison operator root, if it's a relational operator root, root, if it's a arithmetic operator root, you know, then these call various evaluate functions recursively. If it's not one of those tree roots, then it's in this if case. This is the, this is where it does actually. So this is the case where it get, it's if the degree is zero. If the degree is zero, you're in the um, these were all degree zero. You either have an integer literal, a Boolean literal, or a variable. See, there's no tree there. It's just a node. So these are all degree zero branches. These, so when the evaluator sees that it has something with degree zero, then it checks, is it true or false? Then it returns a Boolean value. Does the root match the expression for, a, for an integer? So does the root match? This is the regular expression for an integer, okay? So is the root an integer? If it is, parse the integer using the integer class, okay? Then it says, okay, if it's not a true or false and it's not an integer, it ought to be a variable. So it asks, is this root defined in the environment? If it is, look it up. If it isn't, we've run out of cases, so we have some kind of illegal thing. Okay. Well, if we've got a, a, a degree zero and it's not true, false, integer, or defined variable, it must be an undefined variable. And if we don't have any of these above, then we have just an invalid expression. Okay. So after we exhaust, see, uh, what remember we're doing evaluate expression. So we look at the grammar. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things to check for. If it isn't one of those seven, it's illegal. Okay, so expression should check for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. And that's what it does. It checks for, you know, it, you can go through, it checks for ver, checks for print. Now it checks for these operators, um, it doesn't follow the grammar literally, okay? 
when it gets to this part, it breaks it up into these operators and these operators. So it checks for either these operators or these operators separately. Actually, and these other operators. So see, it, it checks for these operators as one group, checks for these operators as another group, and checks for these operators as another group. So it actually checks for this as three different things. Those operators, these kind of operator, or this kind of operator. So these are Boolean operators, equality operators, and relational operators. So evaluate breaks it up into Boolean operators, equality operators, relational operators, okay? So in the grammar, where it looks like it just checks for one thing, the evaluator actually broke it up into three things. The evaluator broke it up into those three, these, those three is one group, this is another group, and this is another group of operators, okay? So the, the evaluator kind of follows the syntax of the grammar, but sometimes it makes a little, uh, it does things a little bit different. Sometimes the evaluator processes things just a little bit different than the way the grammar says it. So all of those are the Boolean operators, the literal Boolean operators, the equality operators, and the relational operators, okay? So there's one part of, that's this thing. Then after you've checked for, then, then pro, expect, look for arithmetic expressions. The arithmetic expressions are just those, okay? So the evaluator checks for all of them at once. Do you have an arithmetic expression? So that, and if you do, you call evaluated arithmetic expression. Oh, see for Boolean expression, this one's actually the literal Booleans. This one is the equality operators. They're treated separately. And these are the relational operators. So that's why this one does it. it there's one function for the and or and not. No. Yeah, one function for and or and not one function for equality, and one function for relational, okay? So I broke it up into three functions, even though the grammar shows it as one thing here, the evaluator treats that as three different cases, and or not, equality, and relational, okay? But the arithmetic expressions are all lumped in one function, okay? So all the arithmetic operators get evaluated by that guy, okay? And then, then you look for the special, the, the uh, things that the, this guy handles non-recursively. These are handled non-recursively. Is the root true or is the root false? If so, create a value holding the, yeah, holding the Boolean. Now notice I have to turn true and false into a Boolean value in Java. So this guy turns the string true into a Boolean. So if this guy is the string true, then it's equal to true. So this guy evaluates to the Boolean true. If this node is false, it's false that it's equal to true. So this thing evaluates to the Boolean false. So that's a clever way to turn the string into a Java value. So this thing turns the string true and the string false into the Java true and the Java false values. And then those are sent to the value constructor, which gives back one of our tagged values, which would be a tagged Boolean value. Okay, it's a little bit tricky. Okay. So convert the string to a, a Java value, then convert the Java value into one of our values. Okay. Something similar is going on here with the uh, integer. If the string matches the regular expression for an integer, then I take the string and send it to parse int. Parse int turns it into a Java integer. Then I send it to the value constructor, which creates one of our values with the tag int and the value of an integer. Okay, so go. So we're going from string value to Java int. We're going from string to Java integer to one of our tagged values. Okay, so it's a three-step process. String to Java integer to tagged value, okay? And then here we're going from string that's a variable in the environment to look it up in the environment and just get back whatever value it is. So this thing 
this thing, the, the lookup returns the value that that variable holds in the environment. So it doesn't need to be converted. It just is a result. This thing is returning a value. If you go back here to the environment and you look at lookup, see, lookup returns a value. So it returns a legitimate value of our type. It returns one of our type values. So we don't have to construct a value. So you have to construct a value of our type out of a Java Boolean. Here I have to construct a value of our type out of a Java integer, but this guy returns one of our, our values. Okay, all right, so that's step one. So far in the language, we've gone from evaluate prog to evaluate expression. Okay, now evaluate expression, there's all these things. So like over here, we've gotten from evaluate prog to evaluate, you know, we, the evaluate prog will step through this tree and evaluate this guy, evaluate this guy, evaluate this guy, evaluate this guy. Okay, so right now we're in the, you're iterating through the branches of the tree. For each branch of the tree, you call it that evaluate expression. In our case, it's gonna be this first one. So we're gonna call evaluate there. So let's do an ex let's see what evaluate there does. Okay. You give it the tree that it's supposed to evaluate. Notice that by this point, this tree is the subtree. Re oh, real important at this point is that this tree now. You notice you're calling this on the subtrees. When you call this function, you take the subtree of trees. So this function is being called on this subtree. Not, you know, we originally started with this tree. Now we're iterating through these branches. We're calling evaluate expression on that subtree. Okay, so we get the subtree of the tree. So down here, this guy's really a subtree. He's really a subtree of this big tree here. Now we know it's this tree right here. Okay, so that now that tree has a ver at its root. So we call evaluate ver with that tree starting there and the environment, which is still empty, okay? All right, now what does evaluate ver do? So now you go down here and you find there's evaluate ver, okay? Now it does a runtime check. What if there's three branches of the low ver? Or what if there's only one branch? If there's only one branch or there's three branches, something's wrong. So if the degree is not two, blow up, see, throw an exception. You know, that's where a compiler would do this stuff ahead of time. We're, we're writing interpreters, so we have to do these at runtime, which is what JavaScript and Python do. Python programs don't blow up until they run. JavaScript programs don't blow up until they run. If you do something stupid, like you have an if statement with four branches, you know, it, well, no, if statements will be caught earlier than that, there is, they'll be caught by, some of the things will be caught by the parser. So some things in JavaScript and Python are caught by the parser, but other things aren't caught until they're, until the runtime. Our language doesn't catch anything in the parser. Yeah. And, and we could, we could improve our language by putting more responsibility in the parser rather than leaving all the responsibility to the runtime. So our language leaves everything to the responsibility of the runtime. Python and JavaScript split it up. They try to catch as much as they can in the parser, but there's a lot of things that parser can't figure out. So then your program doesn't find out there's a problem until the runtime. Compilers, to, depending on the language, some compilers catch everything at compile time and almost nothing gets left to runtime. So for example, Java catches far more things at compile time than C would. C doesn't catch a whole lot of stuff at compile time. There's a lot of mistakes that pass through the compiler in C. Java catches a lot more. Then there's languages that are ultra modern like Haskell and Rust. They capture huge amounts of errors at compile time. Very few errors get past a, a Rust compiler. In fact, there's an old saying, there was, there's a saying in Rust, that if your program compiles, it's almost always correct. You do most of your debugging in Rust while you're compiling. It's amazing in a language like Rust how many bugs you find in your code while you're compiling. 
you fight with the compiler. When the compiler finally says your program compiles, quite often your program actually is correct at that point. That's certainly not true with Java and jo and Job and and C. But mod ultra modern languages like Py like Haskell and Rust, they've really gotten things designed well. If you can get your language through the compiler, the compiler catches so many problems. You're, you've got a good chance that your program is now correct. So it can take you a long, it can take you a long time to get the compiler to accept your program, but that's way better. You know, it's way better to have your program find. It, it's way better to find your mistakes at compile time than to find them when you're landing an airplane at runtime. Yeah, you know, which is exactly the problem you have with languages like JavaScript. You know, you you JavaScript and Python and even Java, they leave way too many bugs to be discovered at runtime. Okay. Our language leaves everything to be discovered at runtime. Okay. The parser doesn't do anything. So if that there doesn't have two branches, you know there's a problem. Okay. All right. So suppose there's two branches. There still could be a problem. The branches could be five and four. You know, there doesn't have, you know, the parser doesn't check that this is even a variable over here. So we'll see that there's still, there could be other, you'll see there's going to be a lot of runtime checks. Okay. But first check that there's two branches. Okay. So now there's where we're going to store the result. So it's just null so far. Okay. The left branch, let's grab it. So the left branch is what we're going to, what we think should be the variable. Okay. We don't know it is, it could be the, it could be five, but let's grab the left branch. Okay. So from our tree, we get the zero subtree and we get the element. So we're great. We're getting the root of that guy there. Okay. Um, okay, now this gets the right branch, right? So now we get the right branch. So now the right branch, remember, see like here's a there, the left branch should be a variable, but the right branch could be anything. See the right branch. So we get the whole right branch, which is actually an expression. See, it's a tree. It doesn't have to be just a something. In this case, it's, it's just a number. In this case, it's just a number. But over here, notice that the right branch of there, and if we go to the grammar, we see that the right branch of there, see the left branch of there is supposed to be a variable. The right branch of there can be any expression. So what we do is we grab the left branch, don't do anything with it yet, grab the right branch. We think the left, well, we grab the root of the left branch because it should be a variable. We grab the whole right branch because it's a tree and we evaluate the right branch recursively. Okay, evaluate the right branch recursively. So that would, in this case, it would evaluate two. In this case, it would evaluate two. In this case, it would evaluate that sum recursively. So now we've got a variable and a value. Hopefully we have a variable and hopefully we have a value. Now, if this thing was something wrong with it, it would throw an exception. So if the right-hand side had something screwy and it didn't work, this thing would blow up on us. So if it didn't blow up on us, we have a result. We may not actually have a variable on the left, but we do have a result on the right if this thing did not blow up. Okay, now, what do we wanna do? Let's check that the variable really is in the environment, okay? So if the, if the variable is not in the environment, let's add the variable to the environment, okay? Now, what if this guy is not really a variable? Well, add will probably blow up at that point, okay? Let's look at add. Now notice that we haven't really done anything to check that this variable is a variable. There could be the number 22 sitting in there. You know, there could just be the string 22, which isn't a variable, it's just a string 22. Okay, we we haven't checked that this guy really is the right kind of thing. And if we go over here to the environment and we look at add, we'll notice that well add doesn't check anything either. So this is actually here here the 
the, the evaluator is actually being a little bit sloppy here. It lets you put bizarre things in the environment. And I probably should have another runtime check. But what it is, mouse to is I'm really missing a runtime check here. I should check that this variable really is a string that's a proper variable name. If I go to the grammar, variable names should have a certain syntax to them. They're supposed to start with a letter and then they're followed by letters and numbers. Okay, so a variable name starts with a letter and then it's followed by letters and numbers. So two, two is not a variable name, okay? Notice that I'm not actually checking that this string over here is a valid variable name, okay? So that's, yeah, you can say that's actually a bug in the interpreter. It's just, it's not doing, it's actually not doing enough runtime checking. It should do, I, I may actually go back and add that. It should do one more runtime check and make sure this guy really is a valid variable, okay? So what it does is if it's not in the environment, it adds it to the environment, okay? So in this case, that value would be added to the, uh, ver the environment with the name X, okay? If the variable is already in the environment, then you update the variable. Okay, so like if I would, if I said var x2, var x2, this would be an update, not an add. Okay, so if it's not in the environment, you're adding it. If it is in the environment, you're updating it. And I, you know, and I'm missing the runtime check that makes sure that this variable is a legitimate variable. Okay. It, I should be checking just like what I need. Remember how we checked that something is an integer? See how we would use this thing, a match? Okay, I should take that variable and make sure that it matches this. Just like I made an integer match this, I should, I should make a variable match that. So I forgot, I actually, I, I actually just forgot it. I should have I had that in there. I should check that the variable matches that, just like I checked that the integer matches this. That's a function built into Java. Java will do that work for us. Java has the ability to match these regular expressions. Okay, so I should have here, uh, right, probably right after this line here, right after I get the variable, there should be a check that it matches the regular expression that it matches the regular expression for a variable, okay? Okay, so that's what var does. Var gets the variable, recursively evaluates the right-hand side, and then puts that in the environment, okay? So, okay, and then here, if the debug level is greater than zero, it prints out the environment, so you can see the change made in the environment. So this is the, ver this is the debugging information. If you put something in the environment, it'll print the environment out so you could see the changes. That's just debugging information. Okay. All right. Now, let's think about this program when it gets to over here. Okay. You know, this guy's going to be handled just like that guy. This guy's going to be handled just like this guy. Let's imagine we were over here. We're over here. That shows up right there. That's the right tree of a ver. It's a tree. It could be any expression. It could be a multiple, it could be a Boolean expression. It could be, you know, it could be anything. So you recursively call evaluate expression. Notice you're going, this is recursion. See, we're going to go back up to evaluate expression because we don't, it could be any expression here. In the grammar, a ver can hold any expression. So when you want to evaluate this guy, you have to go back up here to evaluate expression because any one of these can sit right there. Any of these could be there, okay? So in the evaluator, when we see that we have, when we're evaluate there, we're evaluating there, we grab the left branch, which is the variable name. We grab the right branch, which is the sub expression. We evaluate the right branch, okay? Now, let's suppose it's this one. So that means we go up here to evaluate expression and we see that it's a plus tree. See, it'll see it's a plus tree and we'll go to evaluate arithmetic expression, okay? So now we're gonna evaluate this tree 
using evaluated arithmetic expression. So you go down here and you look for evaluate arithmetic expression. Here's evaluate print. We'll skip that. Evaluate Boolean expression. Evaluate equality expression. Evaluate relational expression. These functions are more or less in the same order as they are in the grammar. The grammar acts as a table of contents. Here's the evaluate arithmetic expression. Okay. Okay, so we need to evaluate an arithmetic expression. The result's going to be an int. We get the root, which is the operator. We don't know which operator it is. It could be addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, remainder. You know, it could be any one of the arithmetic operators. So we grab the root. Okay. Now, every arithmetic operator has at least one branch. Okay. If we go here to the grammar, we see that every arithmetic operator has at least one branch. They all have a first expression. Then plus can have one or more operands. Subtraction can have one or two operands. Multiplication can have two or more operands. Division can have two, exactly two. Remainders, exactly two. Exponentiation is exactly two. So the plus and the minus can have just one. Plus can be one and minus could be one because that could be the unary negation or the positivity operator. But, but every arithmetic operator has at least one branch. So the evaluator just immediately goes and grabs. It recursively evaluates the left branch. It doesn't know what it is. It knows that there's a left branch, but it's another expression. So if you go to the grammar, what's in an arithmetic expression? The sum of expression, expression. So you're back up here recursively to any one of these expressions. Now, you can't put a Boolean here. See, our grammar's sloppy. Our grammar says that you can put plus of any expression here. So that means you could put a Boolean there, but that's a runtime error. So our grammar, like Java's, a, Java's defined much more carefully than this. Notice that our grammar is a bit sloppy. It's saying that you could take the addition of any expressions, but that means you could take the addition of Booleans, but that'll crash at runtime, okay? Similarly up here, under Boolean expression, you can take the ORing of anything. You could take the ORing of integers, okay? Well, that'll crash ours. Some languages are famous for being real flexible. Like, suppose you want to or an integer. Can you make sense of that? And our language is going to blow up if you or integers. But does, is there a way to make sense of oring integers? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint. Think of C. What is how does C treat Booleans? Are you talking about it accepting zero and one? as true and false yeah uh-huh okay well yeah in, in that case if the, if the so, integers were zero and one well or... but no that's actually not how c does it that's almost how c does it ah okay zero is false right, right. Mm -hmm. what's true one and for for an or zero and one no in the C language, zero is false. Right. And every non-zero value is oh, true. Oh, okay. Five is true. Seven is true. 19 is, is true. Negative four is true. <laughs> Same in JavaScript. So some languages will say, oh, you want to or two integers? Fine. Zero is false. Everything else is true. Okay. JavaScript does it that way. Okay. So you could make sense of oring 
You could go down here and say, oh, I want to or integers and make sense of it. But my, I decided this language wouldn't work that way. What about arithmetic expressions? What if you got here and you had to and and you found a Boolean? Can you make sense of that? You get down here, you see an addition, and you look up this guy and you find out, oh, he's a Boolean. What do you do? Throw an error? No. What if you no, what if you <laughs> want to be flexible? So you want to make want sense to be flexible. Of it. What can you do to make yeah. sense of addition and then it sees a Boolean? Well, if it's uh, add zero, if it's false. And, yeah, good. And what if it's true? Then add whatever value it has. Well, it's true. The value of it is true. <laughs> so, so what do you do with it? What does C do? Oh, so one. One, yeah. In that case, you force it to be one. So in that case, if you translate five turns into the Boolean true, but true always turns into one. That's how C does it. 17 turns into the Boolean true, but the Boolean true turns always into one, okay? JavaScript does it that way also. Now, I did not define this language to work that way. In this language, if you put a Boolean there, it'll blow up on you. That's the way Java would. Java will not let you add a Boolean to an integer, but JavaScript will and C will and C++ will, okay? So you could make sense of a Boolean being in here. You could make sense of it. What I really should have is the grammar should not allow Boolean expressions to be under arithmetic expressions, but that made the grammar way too complicated. So I just left the grammar simple like this. But then down here, it says there's a rule that the arithmetic expressions only take integer values. So if you give the arithmetic expression a Boolean value, it blows up runtime error. Whereas JavaScript, for example, JavaScript is famous for substituting one value in for another value so that the runtime, so that to avoid any kind of runtime error, JavaScript famously will substitute almost anything for anything. So if it's expecting a string and it gets a Boolean, it knows what to do. If it's expecting a Boolean, it gets a string, it knows what to do. If it's expecting an integer and it gets a Boolean, it knows what to do. But the rules are complicated and almost everybody forgets them and it causes all kinds of problems. But JavaScript has, has substitution rules for converting almost anything to anything to avoid runtime errors, okay? So here, the plus, the, the arithmetic operator can take any kind of an expression so in evaluate, when you're evaluating an arithmetic operator, you recursively evaluate the, the operand. But then since it's an arithmetic expression, I'm requiring that the value be an int. So after I get this value, I check, I do the runtime check. If the value of the operand is not a tagged as int, throw an, ex an exception. So here's where the language enforces that this thing really only takes an integer expression and an integer expression. If you give it a Boolean, it'll blow up on you at runtime. So that's done with a runtime check, okay? So now Java does this at compile time. Java at compile time would look at the type of that variable and check that its type is int at compile time and it won't let you add things that aren't ints. It won't let you add, you, know, you can't add a Boolean to an int, right? So here it evaluates the left branch of the operator and expects there to be an integer. If it's not an integer, it blows up. If it is an integer, it stores it in an int. See, it gets the integer value out of the value object and stores it in this int. Okay, and then it then it provisionally assumes that there's going to be a right hand, a, a second operator, and it just says, okay, the R for the right hand one, we'll just set it equal to zero for now. Okay, now there may or may not be a second operand. 
So now you have to check if the degree of the tree is larger than two. Okay. okay. So if there are more branches to the tree, if this thing's got multiple branches, then you start evaluating the branches. Well, first of all, it just evaluates one more branch. Okay. If the degree is greater or equal to two, it's going to evaluate the second branch. So here's where we evaluate the second branch. Runtime check to make sure it's really an int. If we evaluate the second branch and get a Boolean, crash. Okay, so then here's the second value. Okay, now we have to decide, are we doing an addition? Now we've got two values. Well, well, we've got one or two values. We've either got one value from the zeroth branch and we possibly have a second value from the one branch. Because remember, we could have one or two or more branches here. Now that we've got a couple of values, now we really have to know, are we looking at an addition? Are we looking at subtraction? For example, subtraction shouldn't have more than two values, okay, two branches. Are we looking at multiplication? Or are we looking at division? Or are we looking at remainder? Or are we looking at exponentiation? Okay, so we now we check the operator, okay? If the operator is addition, okay, there could be more branches. See, addition can have any number of branches. So we need a tree, a, a for loop to iterate through all the branches of the tree. The multiplication also has to do this. Now, subtraction doesn't. Go back to the grammar. Addition can have any number of branches and multiplication can have any number of branches. Subtraction can have only one or two branches and these others can only have exactly two branches. So this one needs a for loop and this one needs a for loop because there could be arbitrary number of branches, but the others don't need a for loop, okay? So to evaluate a plus expression, if there's only one branch, I'm done. I know what it is because I did it up above. Otherwise, if there's two branches, I add them together. I've already got them. If there's more than two branches, I have to start evaluating them. So I evaluate if there's a third branch, here's where I evaluate it. Here's the runtime check to make sure it's really an int. If it's not an int, blow the whole thing up. If it is an int, create a running total of the sums of the branches, okay? So here's the result. If it's a plus and there's th more than two branches, you're just gonna create a running total of all the branches. So you just iterate through the branches, creating a running total of them, okay? So that finishes the, uh, the plus branch. If it's a subtraction branch, if we were actually looking at subtraction, there could be one or two operands, okay? If the branch, if the degree is greater than two, subtraction throws, blows up. Subtraction doesn't allow more than two branches. So there is a runtime check. Subtraction shouldn't have degree greater than two. If the degree is one, we've already gotten that branch. We return the negation of it. If the degree is not one, then it must be exactly two. So we subtract, and we've already grabbed the two values. They're up here. We grab the two values up here. So we have them already. So the subtraction, if, if there's more than two branches, throw an error. If there's one branch, take the negation of that value. And if there's two branches, subtract them, all right? What if it's a product branch? What if we're looking at a multiplication? It's very similar now to addition. Multiplication does not allow one branch. It doesn't make sense to take, a, it doesn't make sense to take the product of five, okay? You can take the negation of five, you can take the plus of five, but not the product of five. So if, the degree, if, there's, if, the, if it's a product tree with only one branch, we throw an error because the grammar here said that a product branch has a left branch and one or more right branches. See, that's one or more. So a product branch can't just have, it can't be just that, okay? So there's the runtime check. That, that, that check should have been in the grammar. Yeah, again, we're putting more responsibility on the evaluator and a no responsibility on the parser. It'd be nicer to put more responsibility in the parser. So the parser could have checked that at parse time. The parser could have said, this guy 
should have at least two branches. And the parser could have detected that. Okay. And that would just be different. You know, we would put the responsibility in the parser instead of in the evaluator. I put it all in one place. I put it in the evaluator. Okay. And that, that's just, a, that's a simple design choice. I mean, the real world, the real world would try to put as much error checking as early as possible. So in the real world, you'd want as much error checking in the parser as you could, okay? In fact, I, I, that's usually, I, I usually have that as a later homework assignment where I have you move a lot of this error checking code from the evaluator into the parser. I used to have that as a homework assignment. I'm not sure if I'll give it to you this, time, this semester or not, but I used to have that as a homework assignment where it essentially says, Go through and move as many of these runtime checks as you can from the evaluator and move them into the parser where they really belong, okay? So right now they're in the evaluator. So if multiplication has one branch, blow up, okay? So if it doesn't have one branch, it's got at least two branches. We, we already got those values. Now we iterate through the other branches. If there are more branches, we keep a running product of them. And every time we evaluate a branch, we have to do a runtime check to make sure we got really an integer because somebody could sneak a Boolean in there and we will not allow that. We won't allow any Booleans snuck into the product, okay? Even though the grammar allows that, yeah, you know, again, the grammar allows you to put a Boolean in there, but the runtime doesn't allow Booleans in there. That would be a hard thing to check. Now our grammar, see the parser couldn't detect that. If we even, even if we put more che error checking in our parser, our grammar says you can put a Boolean there. So our parser would not be able to figure that out because the language says it's okay to put a Boolean right there. So that would still have to be a runtime check. Even if we had a better parser, we would need this check here at runtime. And Python needs that check at runtime because the parser, the grammar, doesn't really, the grammar cannot enforce type rules. You can't enforce type rules in a grammar. That's kind of hard to do. Okay. So it's kind of hard to write a grammar that says that you can't have a Boolean there. It's a little bit tricky. So you, the, the fact that you can't have a Boolean, now the fact that you need two or more operands there, I can check that in the parser real easily. The fact that this is one or more operands or one or two, the fact that this is one or two operands and no more, I could check that at parse time real easily. And I could check the number of operands here. So I could check the number of operands real easily at parse time, but not the type of the operand. That would be hard to check at parse time, okay? So I can get rid of some of these checks, like that check I could get rid of at runtime by putting it in the parser. This, I couldn't get rid of at runtime. I would need that still there at runtime, okay? And then notice that uh, for division, remainder, and exponentiation, there should be exactly two branches, exactly two branches, exactly two branches. All these could be done by the parser. Those checks could all be done by the parser. Those guys are supposed to be exactly two branches, okay? All right, let's look at, real quick, let's look at one more. Let's look at what print does. Like, what happens when you evaluate print? Okay, okay. So you go look up here for evaluate print. Okay, here's evaluate print. Okay, print looks like now print should have one branch. You're printing an expression, so print should have one branch. So if the degree of the tree is not one, again, the parser could check this for us, but we check it at runtime. Print should have only one branch, okay? If it has more than one branch, blow up, okay? If it's got one branch, recursively evaluate that branch because you could be printing anything. So you could print any expression. So you go back up here to evaluate expression, okay? So print evaluates the expression. Now it doesn't care what type it is, so it doesn't do any type check, okay? And then it just calls the Java print method to print the result. And if the if debugging is on, it prints a verbose version of the result. If debugging is off, it prints a simple version of the result. So I'm using Java's print function to do the languages print. So, and then the result is the, re the whatever value 
whatever value this thing evaluated to, that's what print returns. The value of print is the value of this expression. Now in Java, print doesn't have a value. In Java, print does not return a value, but in our language, it does. In our language, print returns whatever it printed. So in our language, you could do really weird things like this. You could, um, you can't do this in Java, but in our language, and you can do this in some other languages too. You can do uh, five plus print six. That adds five to six. It prints the six. Now, if you did this, our language will let you do that. What would it print out? What would that print out? I agree with Bruno. <laughs> okay, Probably. why would it print the six first? This print comes first, it's printing 11. So why wouldn't it print 11 and then six? Because this print comes second. I'm just guessing because it's inside parentheses. Well, yeah, so you do what's inside parentheses <laughs> first, right? Yeah. Another way to think about it is this print doesn't know what its operands are until after it's evaluated this. So before you can do this print, you have to evaluate this plus. Before you can evaluate that plus, you have to evaluate this print. So, so you think of it as a tree. The tree is print with left branch five and right branch print. No, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's print with one branch, which is a plus with the left branch being a five and the right branch of the plus being a print with the branch of the print being a six, okay? To do this print, first you have to do that plus. To do that plus, first you have to do that print. So then you've printed the six, that returns six here, five plus six is 11, then you print 11. So the output, like Bruno said, the output would be six, then 11 in that order, because you because of the order of operations. You can't do that print until you've actually done everything inside of it first. So you have to evaluate it from the bottom up. The tree has to be evaluated from the bottom up. So even though this print comes first, that print's done last. This print comes second, that print's done first, okay? But the key is in this language, print returns a value. So you can nest prints inside of expressions. Some languages do that. I think Python maybe does it that way. Some languages print is an expression expression so print returns a value and it returns pretty much whatever it printed okay all right so and you can see that see that so so that's how it works then every 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 piece of the language has code that evaluates that piece of the language and you're going to add code to do the pre and post increment operators okay so you're going to be you're going to add an evaluate increment op. You're going to you're going to write a method. You're going to write a method like this, but it's going to be evaluate increment expressions for pre and post increment expressions. Okay. So you're going to be adding one of these functions to the interpreter. Actually, you're going to be adding two of them: one for increment operators and one for the spaceship operator. So you're going to add two of these methods to the evaluator. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. So that's a walkthrough, you know, there's a walkthrough of the evalu evaluate. Yeah, read, again, read the code carefully and you know, you, you're gonna mimic these guys here. You're gonna, you're gonna add, you're gonna have to add one of these functions here to, to get this. Oh. See, 
you're going to need these and this. You could you could have four new you could have five new functions. I lumped these all in one function, and I had one function for this. So and when I did it, I had I lumped all these in one function, just like there's one function that does all the uh, arithmetic expressions. I but you if you want you could have five functions, one for each of these operators, or you could have one function that somehow lumps all of them together, and you'll need a function for this guy. Okay. Right. But notice you'll also need to change this function a little bit because see, it has to call those. Okay. And oh, there's a misprint here. I'm missing. I have to fix that. It's missing that. Okay. An expression is either these guys. This guy, that's the new stuff, and then this is the old stuff. So you're gonna have to change this function because it has to catch these new operators, and then you have to add a function for these and a function for these. And again, you can either do four functions for each one function for each of these, or you can lump them all into one function, and then you'll need a function for this guy. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll quit there, going over time. If you have uh if you have questions about this, you know, it you you don't have to write a lot. And when you write these functions, everything you need can probably be copied and pasted out of other evaluate functions. You, know, you can probably just mimic these carefully. If you, if you read them carefully enough, you can probably cut and paste code out of various evaluate functions to build these new ones. Okay. But you have to understand what you're doing. Okay, So you just have to read this code carefully and then build those, you know, and then build those and this. And and how to, and see how to modify this one to add that part. Okay. Any question? Any question at all? Okay. So today's Wednesday. So we'll meet again on Monday. So uh, have a nice weekend. You know, I, I have office hour on Thursday. So if you have questions, you can come to office hour on Thursday. And otherwise, you can send me an email and ask questions. And you know, basically. It's a homework exercise in, in, in reading code. I actually think of this as a homework exercise more in reading code than writing code. Because if you've read and understood this, you basically just have to copy and paste pieces, a chunk here and a chunk there and piece, put, put them together and you'll get the, the functions you need. There's not a whole lot you have to do. Okay, so it's an exercise in reading and understanding someone else's code. All right, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing now. And I'll go. Uh, and so we'll meet again on on Monday. And if you have questions, come to office hours or send me email. Okay. So have a nice weekend. Bye.